Happy with their nominal sovereignty, citizens cease to bother with anything genuinely political. Finally, Rancé speaks of metapolitics. Here he has reference to political philosophies, most of them Marxist and Leninist by name, that construct what Rancé calls, quote, a symptomology that detects a sign of untruth within every political distinction. This approach, then, allows for the reality of antagonism and disagreement, but asserts that all such conflict is meant only in the end to cancel itself out, that politics is a means to an end, indeed, to its end. Metapolitics runs aground in its failure to take the next step in thinking through the problematic of the withering away of the state, which becomes particularly pressing for, if largely unaddressed in Marxist thinking, after, as Badiou has put it, quote, the Leninist party proved itself incommensurable to the tasks of the transition to communism, despite the fact that it is appropriate to those of the victorious insurrection. This third political philosophy, then, also obscures the difference between policing and politics. Its very aim to achieve an eventual abolition of politics betrays its failure to distinguish the police from genuine political activity. For Rancier, what breaks with these three derelictions of the political is democracy, not parliamentary democracy, which would be uh, a form of parapolitics, but democracy as the insistent and resistant reemergence at every moment of the unnamed and indiscernible. But, uh, and I think this is a crucial question, is it advisable to employ the name democracy for such a politics? Rancier himself recognizes the historical complexity in which the term entangles itself. Indeed, the 10 years between 1995 and 2005, as Rancier's own interventions make quite clear, marked a radical reversal in public regard, especially in Europe, for so-called democracy, parliamentary democracy. In 1995, in disagreement, Rancier, because of the way public discussion dissembled the possibility of what he was calling democracy, had to express his concern about, quote, the triumph of democracy being trumpeted everywhere. By 2005, however, in hatred of democracy, Rancé found himself with the task of clarifying the democracy he had in mind in order to disentangle it from the almost universal antipathy towards so-called democracy that had emerged after the reversals of the first decade of the 21st century. Recognizing these difficulties, Rancé persists in his use of the word democracy. The difficulties are formidable without question, but it isn't clear what other term could be used to more effect, just speaking uh, in terms of strategy. Alain Badiou's recent employment of the term communist and his anti-Sarkozyan proffering of the communist hypothesis has demonstrated how problematic it would be to use terms traditionally associated with the far left. I watched this fascinating BBC, I was telling Max that was today, this uh, BBC show and Badiou was on there uh, doing an interview and uh, the guy just could not handle his use of the word communist. <laughs> it's BBC a hard talk, you yeah. can find it on YouTube. Yeah, it's on YouTube. Um, but he's demonstrated how problematic it might be, at least at the popular level. And the term democracy has the undeniable <coughs> advantage of being discussed in precisely the sense Rancière employs in the works of Plato and Aristotle. At any rate, as Badiou has argued in his own speculative disquisition on the concept of democracy, which is a piece quite obviously written in part as an investigation of the usefulness of Rancière's political theory, uh, that, de that the word democracy can and should still be reclaimed by those engaged in the work of constructing emancipatory political theory. As a friend of mine often says, why should the devil have all the good words? Um, so if that clarifies the question of democracy for now, why bother with aesthetics? So if all the, the above has begun to spell out Rancé's political theory, I'd like now to address a basic question that must be asked by the politically serious. Why has Rancé come to place such a heavy emphasis on the aesthetic in his recent work? Or in other words, what has aesthetics to do with politics? It is worth pointing out that the question of the aesthetic has appeared in Rancière's work from the beginning of the three periods I laid out earlier. Hints that Rancière cannot distinguish the political from the aesthetic appeared as early as The Philosopher and His Poor in 1983, where he dedicated some of his most poignant pages to an analysis of Plato's ejection of the artistic from his projected republic. Much more strikingly, in his 1987, The Ignorant Schoolmaster dared to assert that, quote, a society of the emancipated would be a society of artists that emancipation begins with one's being able to say, me too, I'm a painter. There are obvious anticipatory echoes here of his more recent The Emancipated Spectator. But these passing reflections came to a head in the names of history when Rancé found himself arguing that... Uh, wow, what was I writing then? When Rancé found himself arguing that uh, what he would come to call metapolitics is rooted in a very particular poetics of history writing. All of this paved the way to his eventual privileging of the aesthetic. The whole of Rancé's work on the aesthetic in its relation to the political is rooted in a single, almost banal insight. The rise of what folks in the humanities call art pour the art, art for art's sake, suggestively took place, both historically and geographically, right alongside the rise of emancipatory politics. 
Ramsey's work on aesthetics are the unfolding of a consistent effort to investigate this parity, to show that there is a crucial connection between the political and artistic inv inventions of the late 18th and early 19th century. But this is, in the end, only half the equation. Rancier is doing much more than simply exploring the possibilities suggested by the historical record. As all of his interventions on the question of the aesthetic make clear, there is a contemporary impetus, impetus for his investigations as well. Most of the French and German derailings of Marxism in the 20th century have been rooted in aesthetic theories. Whether the various kinds of derailings at work in the Frankfurt School, or whether the more recent derailings at work in thinkers like Jean Baudrillard, Jacques Derrida, or Jean-François Lyotard. The immense effort Rancière is dedicating to correcting the aesthetic theories of all these leftists, but not really emancipatory thinkers, is affected primarily through his reinterpretation of what was happening in the paired inventions of the aesthetic and the emancipatory at the turn of the 19th century. Aesthetics has had, as Rancière argues, a rather odd and unfortunate career in the 20th century. The century dawned with a double effort, on the one hand, to construct an essentially communistic artistic pra practice, and on the other hand, to construct an essentially Marxist critical theory. Along the way, these two apparently separate efforts combined to make inflated and not often enough implicit promises about the possibilities bound up within art for recreating society in a just fashion. When it came to be seen that such efforts yielded no real practical effects, apart from the expansion of so many university literature departments, the promise of the emancipatory potential of art was abandoned as much by critical theorists as by political activists. On the one side of the line, emancipatory politics was abandoned in favor of an almost theological liberalism, on the other side of the line, critical theory was abandoned as so much academic puffery. Those are obviously caricatures, but... Uh, Rossi's work on aesthetics diagnoses this situation in a strikingly novel fashion. The problem was not that politics and art should never have been brought together. Rather, the problem was that politics and art were already inextricably intertwined. And this essential entanglement was not only overlooked, but in many ways abandoned during the construction of communistic artistic practices and Marxist critical theory. In other words, art and theory did not really do anything new in the first decades of the 20th century. Marxist artists and theorists were doing what all artists and theorists had been doing for more than a century already. And their mistake was to attempt to do something different from what had been done. So what had been happening for a century before the rise of communist art and Marxist theory? Critical theory. Uh, Rancière argues that the end of the 18th century saw the rise of what he calls the aesthetic regime in art. This regime distinguishes itself from the representative regime that preceded it. The representative regime, from before the 19th century, was that regime in art where a given work of art was measured in terms specifically of a set of canonical rules established by an aristocratic artistic tradition. Note that it was not a question of imitation or mimesis. He argues strongly against that long-standing idea. The aesthetic regime, dawning in the 19th century, on the other hand, dismisses the rules of the representative regime, blurring the lines between art and non-art. The world of art was thus, from the time of the French Revolution, blurring the very same distinctions that were being blurred in the world of emancipatory politics. The difference between art and artisanship, between the capacities of the distinct classes, was being dismissed, and the aristocratic rules of how things were to be produced, whether artistically or in terms of economics, were being overthrown in the name of the new era. I haven't the time to get into the details of this argument any more than this, though I would very much like to. Uh, I find Rancé's criticism of Alain Badiou's theory of art particularly interesting, but I haven't the time to discuss it in detail. I'll only outline it uh, because of its complexity. So I'll say just this about this point. Rancé finds Badiou to be a kind of inversion of most aesthetic thinkers today. Whereas most have, because of the approach to the aesthetic, abandoned emancipatory politics, Badiou has not. And Rancé takes as his own task to show that Badiou, against his own explicit intentions, reproduces Rancé's theory of the aesthetic in his work tries to sound like all the rest of these aesthetic thinkers, but he actually reproduces Rancière's aesthetic theory. And it's a brilliant argument. Uh, for Rancière, Badiou could not do otherwise, in fact, unless he were to abandon emancipatory politics in its entirety. And anyone who has read Badiou knows that that isn't likely to happen. 